All right. If anyone has any questions, you know, feel free, raise your hand, interrupt me. Also, at the end, we're a little short help today. So at the end, I'm here till 5. If everyone could just get right upstairs, we can hang out there all day. And I'll answer everyone's questions. All right? So we're going to be talking about inflammation today, understanding inflammation. And inflammation, depending upon what's going on in your life, you a lot of people think of it as arthritis or bone pain, but inflammation also has to do with the digestive tract, with the skin, eczema, psoriasis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, IBS. It has to do with heart disease, high cholesterol. It has to do with lack of energy. So inflammation is really one of the underpinnings of just about every disease state we develop. And I'll be going into a little bit is good inflammation and bad inflammation. Inflammation can be very, very healthy and we need it, but if it goes on too long or too high, it starts destroying tissues and systems. So we don't want to just block it. We want to understand is it acute, which we want to help it, or is it chronic? We want to find out why the body hasn't been able to do what it's trying to do and assist the body. And this webinar, or this isn't a webinar, this talk and any associated information materials are for educational purposes. And these statements have been brought up by the FDA. So I think here on the legal side. All right, and here we go. So a survey on WebMD found that 30% of Americans reported having joint pain in the last 30 days. How sad is that? 30% of everyone in America has joint pain. Knee pain was most common, followed by shoulder, hip, and joint pain can affect any joint in the body. So it's really anywhere, shoulders, hands. As we age, um, the pain of the joints increases, and that isn't necessary. Very common, happens all the time, but a lot of you probably, if you bump into some of your peers, you'll probably find some of them are walking like this, and others are more limber than I've probably been in my whole life, and are doing more. I see people at the gym, I'm 63, that are older than I am, and I would like to be half as active as they are. And then I see people who are much younger than I am, and I can't believe they go to bend down to tie their shoe, and they really have to work at getting down on a knee. They can't bend down to tie their shoe. So a lot of it is preventable. And a lot of it is self-inflicted. <coughs> About 43.5%, which is 23 million people, um, have doctor-diagnosed arthritis in the United States today. By the year 2040, they estimate 78 million people, 26% of the population, is going to have diagnosed arthritis. And so that's knee replacement, hip replacement, the neck problems, and all that. And again, a good portion of this is preventable. With the aging U.S. population, the prevalence of doctor-diagnosed arthritis is going to increase. And if you look at the chart, it's just going up almost vertically, which is really a shame. Now, this is the big thing. If it's untreated, right? You're saying it's not necessarily so. Yes. If we take care of it beforehand, we, we don't have to have 78 million people with arthritis. Okay. Yes? It's, well, it's because the population is getting older, but it's also a lot, if they factor in the number of mature people and the percentage that has doctor-diagnosed arthritis, the percentage is going up and up, even when you factor that we have more older people. So it really, we're going in, in the wrong direction. Okay, pain is a leading cause of disability and a major contributor to our health care expenses, which is, and disability, which is really hitting all of us. Our insurance rates are way up because a lot of us aren't taking care of ourselves. And an example of that, which really amazes me, we have um, in the, for the store for our health plan, Blue Cross started something new for some of the mid-sized groups. 
if you go to your doctor and give them a one page form and they fill it out with just your stats, your health stats, you get $100 for going for a physical, which there's no copay, it's free. So you get $100 for giving someone a piece of paper. If your numbers are pretty good, you get a total of $300 if your lifestyle is good. If your numbers are terrible and your lifestyle is terrible, you have 12 months to have to show that you are changing your lifestyle and they'll give you the balance of the money. So it's really free money for a piece of paper and taking care of yourself. If diabetes runs in the family, you're doing everything right, and your blood sugar's off, you get the $300. That's a pat on the back. The sad part is, last year we only had a 60% follow through on that, which really amazes me. If for a piece of paper, I can get $300. I'll carry reams of paper around with me all day. But if, they, if people aren't willing to do that for free money, are they willing to do the work to really take care of themselves? The good thing is, this year, we're what, at the 18th of the month? 20th. So we're only part way into the first month, and we've already exceeded that number. So everyone sort of realized yeah, this is good. Okay, when conventional medicine fails to relieve the pain, doctors really are desperate. They want you to feel better. So they start prescribing opioids. And prescription opioids can be safe when taken as directed. It is a good drug for a short period of time. They're really overprescribed. Come on in. The body can become addicted and forms a dependence on opioids and it can start in a very short time. How is this for a good statistic? Americans consume 80% of the pain pills in the world. Okay, most of those are opioids. They drug, the opioids research has shown work maximum for about 90 days. After 90 days, you're hooked to it, the brain doesn't use the opioid the way it should, and you sat with emotional problems, feelings of hopelessness and desperation, and you're in pain again. So the opioids aren't the answer. And so we have to stop going with, give me a pill for that symptom. Most people suffering with pain are significantly more likely lately to start looking at what can I do, oops, what can I do, sorry about that, what can I do to help myself and what can I ingest, whether it be food or a supplement, to help the body do what it's trying to do to get the inflammation down as opposed to the, the Motrin's and things like that. So we are moving in, in the right direction. Okay. <coughs> Causes of joint pain. This was from WebMD. If you did a search on WebMD of what causes joint pain, these are all the different uh, there's pages of them, but these are some of them. Um, arthritis is an inflammation of one or more joints, and that makes up about a third of the list of pain is from arthritis. Every one of these things listed has an inflammatory side to it, which we can aggravate or we can make better. So what's going on in the joints are to cause the pain? One of them, and I'll show you, everyone heard of collagen? Mm -hmm. This was real big in the 60s with the hippies, and then it disappeared. And then the, one of the reasons it disappeared was it comes from cows, and the cows are loaded with antibiotics and growth hormone, and they're being fed feed with pesticides in it. So you were getting collagen, which is healthy, along with all the other stuff, which is unhealthy. So the net effect was either even or you're losing. Now there's a bunch of companies that have grass-fed, pasture-raised cows or steers, and that's where they get the collagen from. Collagen not only helps fill in under the skin, it helps with our wrinkles, but it also is very important in the joints and it can be very helpful for inflammation and arthritis, both in the digestive tract, in the joints, it helps with the hair, the skin, the nails. And when something 
in my mind, has all these wonderful effects with just having some of it. It's like seasoning in a soup. That must mean it's necessary for us to be healthy and we're not getting enough of it if we notice a change. What's nice about the collagens is it doesn't change any liquid. You can put it into soup, you can add it to your oatmeal, you can add it to your coffee. They even have a non-dairy creamer which is collagen and coconut milk. And so there's all different things you can be doing with it and very, very, very healthy. Um, so that's the collagen. Um, other things that we're doing to ourselves that are causing the problem, a lot of us have a very inactive lifestyle. We're sitting, we're working at a desk, we're working at a computer, or we're retired, we're not out and about, we're meant to be moving, we're sitting watching TV on the couch, or we're working real hard on a computer, or you see the kids, and now the adults, like this, texting all the time. My chiropractor said, if you have your head bent forward doing this, it's like putting a 35 pound weight on your neck. Mm -hmm. So what's that gonna do for arthritis going forward, mm -hmm. you know, for the kids? Plus, we're probably gonna start seeing more and more thumb joint replacements. I can't believe how fast they can. <laughs> um, overuse, if you're a runner, or you're pounding on the ground, or repet people who sew or knit, are tight, the overuse causes it, poor posture, injuries, trauma, and autoimmune diseases, which is a toxicity issue, um, causes inflammation. Something, um, when I was at one of my classes, they said, every once in a while, just put your heels up against the wall, you know, like uh, a Marine. And you'll be amazed, you get up against the wall and you're like this. And you start going back and it's like a foot and a half until you're there and it feels very awful. This is the way we're supposed to be, straight up and down. Same thing in the car. If you set your headrest so it's maybe an inch further back than having your head up straight, in a car we're definitely rolled over. That's just the position. So if you have your headrest right, Every once in a while, just bring your head back till it touches the headrest and move it forward in it. And you'll be amazed as 20 minutes, a half hour ride goes on, you're further and further forward. And that puts stress, if you're stressing up here, that goes all the way down the back, that can affect down to your knees and your ankles. So it's not just the one area where you are. Autoimmune disorders that increase inflammation, Hashimoto's, hypothyroid, thyroidism, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, those are all a toxicity issue. When the body gets toxic and it can't get the waste product or the toxins out, it buries them in the connective tissue. And that's to keep it away from the vital organs, the eyes, the brain, the heart, the kidneys. And what happens is when you have all that junk buried in the connective tissue, it helps your vital organs, but that leads to inflammation. And then you ate more, and what do we do? We take Motrin. And if you take Motrin, that stresses the liver, which makes more metabolic waste that you're not able to get rid of, and you bury more toxins in. Short term, it might be helpful. Long term, it's not gonna, you're gonna wind up going backwards much, much faster. Oh, boy. <clears throat> Inflammation's an immune response, and it's very, very important. If you twist your knee, or bang yourself really bad, or you slip and fall, it's probably gonna get warm, swollen, sometimes red. It should be uncomfortable. If you twisted your ankle, you want it to swell up, and you want it to hurt. Well, you really don't, but it's a good thing. And that's because if it didn't, it's injured, and it has to heal, and you would overuse it, which would damage it even more. So acute inflammation is very, very beneficial. We need that, it's very important. So same thing, you don't want to always suppress inflammation. If it's acute, you can say why you had the problem, not that, well this has been going on for four and a half years, definitely isn't acute. You want to assist the body with the inflammation. When it gets red and hot, that's a bunch of chemical mediators in the body, dilating blood vessels, getting the white blood cells, getting a lot of nutrients in there, 
and bring fluid in there to immobilize the joint and you let the fibrin form and you let the body take away all that damaged protein and then the inflammation goes away and the body gets the fluid to go away and you're back to normal. If we suppress it with anti-inflammatories needlessly, what happens is we don't have that heal, so then it's a damaged tissue which will be easier to injure again and again and again. And I'm sure a lot of us, if we have bad knees or a bad hip or a bad foot, your gait is off. And if your gait's off, you're straining other joints. So even though it's the knee that's no good, it could be the hip on the other side that starts bothering you. So we really need to fix the problems, not just suppress them. Time Magazine, when Time Magazine was a real big magazine, um, they had two different covers, and I couldn't find the other one. The other one's about 30 years old, and it showed a human heart with flames coming out of it. And they were talking about, way, way back then, when Lipitor first came out, Lipitor and cholesterol isn't the problem with the heart. That's a flag the body's waving, and it's putting out the extra cholesterol for a reason. It's free radicals and internal inflammation that's causing the plaque to build up and the clogging of the arteries. They had a follow-up, the secret killer, that inflammation is behind heart attack, cancer, Alzheimer's, bowel issues, skin issues, arthritis, cholesterol, prostate, carpal tunnel, fibromyalgia, and basically any chronic condition, or just about any chronic condition, if you think about it, it does have an inflammatory um, cause behind it. So why are we having so many problems like this? Well, one of the reasons we don't really separate acute and chronic. The minute we have a pain, and I'm not saying us, because you're here, so you guys are way ahead of the curve because you want to do things to help your body, not just suppress it. But people in general, the minute they have either acute or chronic pain, they want pain meds, they want non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, they stop moving, then you don't feel good and you start going for the comfort foods. And we'll see in a few slides, most of the comfort foods are pro-inflammatory. So you're just making it worse, so you feel worse, and then it's, right, I can't move. How can I go to the gym? How can I go for a walk? So some acute, some acute problems, if you had a chemical burn, frostbite, cuts, sprains, allergies, um, infections, they're all, very healthy inflammation. And we talk, I talked, I forget which lecture, about fever. Fever is very important. And our immune system really activates at about 101, 102. But at 99 or 99.9, .9, we start getting achy and don't feel good. And we suppress the fever. So we don't let our immune system do its work fully. We suppress it so we're sick longer. So same thing with acute inflammation. You don't want to aggravate it. You want to be comfortable, but you want to let the body to have the inflammation to heal. If we don't take care of it properly, then we get into chronic inflammation. I'll try to switch sides, remind me, so I don't keep standing in front of you. And with the chronic inf inflammation, then we have tissue destruction. We start getting into heart problems, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain, autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's, and eventually cancer. Some symptoms of chronic inflammation, redness, joint stiffness, bloating and belching, burning, dark circles under the eyes, the itchy ears and eyes, diarrhea or constipation, it can be either way depending on what's going on in the body. You can have some muscle spasms, twitching, cramps, now that doesn't mean if you have restless leg at night, you're inflamed. But if you are inflamed, you could have these symptoms. So what you really want to think about is if you have a bunch of them, then you probably are having a problem. There's our favorite medicines, the Motrin, the Advil, the Aleve, and they're really doing a job on us. Um, the FDA has said 10 mil they analyzed 10 million patient records, and the dangers of NSAIDs are clear. I learned this in pharmacy school in the 70s, that they're good drugs, 
but you should only take them when you need them. And what's really been interesting, up until about a year ago, it's even safe for pregnant women to take. And you can live on these, it's perfectly fine. This is a very safe drug, that and acetaminophen. Now all of a sudden, with lawsuits, it's going a different way. And they're realizing they're good if you need them for short term, but not to live on them. The non-steroidals, the ibuprofens and things like that, can raise the risk of heart failure by 20%. That increase in the amount of NSAIDs a person takes, so the more you take, the higher risk you are of having a heart problem. Taking OTC NSAIDs makes one three times more likely to have a GI problem. And there are people who are hospitalized or die from bleeding in the GI tract. Now, does that mean never take them? No, but use them when you absolutely need to, and you always want to take the least amount for the shortest period of time to give you the best effect. So it isn't that it's available without a prescription, so it's perfectly safe, so I can just keep taking it. Excuse me. Yes. Do you know if any, any of those studies separated out the, the, the primary stimulant, you know, the cause, the, uh, the, the primary reason why the individual was taking the aspirin or whatever it is, NSAIDs, um, in the first place. So if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're a chronic drinker and you wake up in the morning with a headache right. and you take an NSAID every day, how do you separate out the fact that you're a chronic Very drinker good. from the fact question. that you're taking the NSAID? So there's always many variables, but that study and a couple others that you know, were quoted in my notes, were from people using the NSAIDs for arthritis and, and chronic pain. Now granted, if you're in chronic pain, you might be drinking, but not, <laughs> I don't think not the vast majority. But it's not carved in stone, but they definitely, even the warning on the labels now says even low dose can increase your risk of heart problems. Thank okay. you. Okay. <coughs> In my mind, we're back to stress. You know, I, we have, I don't know if any of you have talked to you about stress before. Stress is one of the biggest killers. Our diet, our digestive system, stress and inflammation. Those are, I'll say, all self-regulated by us, even though stress, you can't control a lot of it. One of my clients, an elderly, you know, 63, so elderly, I think she was 91, now 90. It's funny how that um, She said to me, the secret of life is the 2080 rule. And they usually do that with, we wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. We use 20% of our pots 80% of the time. We could get rid of 80% of the stuff we have and never miss it. She said, that's great. She said, stress-wise, you only have control over about 20% of the things that stress you. 80% of it, no matter what you do, you're never going to change. It's usually another person. You're never going to change them. So we spend our whole life going through the same thing over and over again and banging our head up against the wall. So I said to her, that's great, but what do you do? And she said, it's real hard, but we have to figure out a way eventually to let that person think they're right. It doesn't matter who's right, you want to get the stress off you. So if they say do it this way, and you know that's the wrong way and you have to get to a certain point, tell them great, you're right, you know, I'm gonna go do it. Get to the end point, let them know you did it their way, and be done with it. And then every, something that comes up every month, you know what to do. Why get re-aggravated over the same thing every single month when you're never going to be able to change it? So we really have to worry about stress. Now, there's all different types of stress. There's lack of sunshine. gives you lack of vitamin D. Lack of vitamin D has a big effect on inflammation and collagen formation. Digestive problems. If you have either an upset stomach, acid burning, or you have IBS, or you have constipation, or you have diarrhea. If you think about it, from here to here is the most critical part of our body because that's when we eat good food, we have to break it down, absorb the nutrients, poop out the garbage, and nourish our body. 
And that's one of the most important things we can do because we have millions of reactions that are going on in our body every second and they all require different minerals or different nutrients or calories or whatever. So it's almost like in your car, if you're going to drive from here to New York, you look at the gas gauge and you want to start with the gas gauge on full. And let's say it's on empty. Are you just interested where the needle is or are you interested what's in the gas tank? You could take your garden hose, fill up the tank with water and have a full tank. You're not getting to New York. So our body is the same thing. You don't want to have a full stomach with garbage. You want to have a full stomach of the right octane fuel because we can't replace our bodies yet. So the eating is very important, but also pooping is very important. And we're very embarrassed about talking. With babies, we talk about poops. With the senior citizens around the pool, it's all talking about poops or colonoscopies. And in the middle, when it's most critical, we don't think about it or we don't talk or we don't ask questions. But very, very important. That's also how we get rid of the metabolic waste. We generate a ton of it every day just from living. And when we get good night's sleep, that's when the body does phase one, phase two detoxing, dumps everything into the kidneys or into the bowel, and we get all this dangerous, nasty metabolic waste out of it. So if you're constipated, it's sitting in there. And if your bowel is full, how can the new food get down there to get broken down and absorbed? So that either gives you diarrhea because it starts rotting and the body wants to get rid of it and you don't get the nutrients, or you get more and more full, and that can lead to more acid reflux. Then you take Zantac or one of the acid reducers, and with less acid, it slows down motility. Your enzymes don't work as well. You don't absorb calcium as well, and you're not getting the nutrients out of the food, which then makes the digestive system function at a lower level, which then you have all this food at 98.6 degrees sitting there fermenting, which causes inflammation in the bowel. And then I'll show in a couple minutes how that causes more things to get absorbed, which feeds inflammation in the body. So eating well is really one of the key things we can be doing, not just for inflammation. You want to be drinking enough water sipping water all through the day. That helps bring nutrients in and waste product out. You want to get a good night's sleep. And that's easier said than done, but you want to figure out what's preventing you from getting a good night's sleep. Because when we're sleeping, when we're in REM sleep, that's when we do phase one, phase two detoxing, which breaks down all the inflammatory and the bad things in our body. <laughs> and we get rid of it the next morning when we get up. We want to correct your diet, if you have a poor diet, processed foods, a lot of chemicals in it, not enough nutrients, the body can't function and is spending all this energy trying to get rid of and break down the things we're not supposed to have in our body. And so it can't do work in other areas because it's working on this dangerous stuff. So the poor diet is very, very important. There's more and more being talked about mitochondria and the, genet the genome and all that. Mitochondria, every single cell is loaded with mitochondria. That's where everything goes on, where we make hormones, where we break down things, where we make ATP and energy, where we help with hormone balancing, making them and breaking them down, where we make the bile and where we make all the enzymes we need and where we get our energy and where the adrenals get what they need and the thyroid makes the thyroid hormones. Mitochondria, as we age, we start losing them. And the problem with that is, as we age, that's why one of the reasons we're slowing down. Because those are the fuel cells in the cell. So there's a product, PQQ, and coenzyme Q10. PQQ is the first thing we found that they've been able to go into the cells and see over a long period of time, it helps the body make more mitochondria. But the mitochondria require magnesium, manganese, selenium, zinc, you know, just little amounts of a whole lot of minerals for those enzymes to work properly. So if your bowel isn't working well, or you're not eating well, or you're constipated, 
you're not getting those nutrients in. So even down to the smallest organelle in the cell, that isn't functioning well. And if that isn't functioning well, how can you function well? So that's why at the cellular level and the free radical level from the lousy diet and stress, why some people age much faster and other people you can't believe that they're as old as they are because they look so good because the stress ages us so much faster. Mm -hmm. Can I ask yes. a question? So, you know, I've read a fair amount, as I'm sure everybody in the room has, about the coins on Q10 and Q2 and those mm -hmm. kinds of supplementations. But what I don't understand very well is what are the natural sources of those elements so that, you know, if we wanted to, instead of supplement, if we wanted to eat a diet rich in things that will cause coenzyme Q10 to form or PQQ to form, okay. what, what do we eat? Good question. Most of the coenzyme Q10 and PQQ our bodies make. So if you go, if you Google online, there's no way you could eat enough to get, as we get older and we're making less to pick up the difference. And the flip side of that is, you don't need mega doses of it. It's like seasoning in a soup. We just need some. So they now the CoQ10, it comes in 100, 200. Now they have six and 800. And you, for certain conditions, you might need 600 three times a day. For the average person, 100 to 200 milligrams is more than enough. And um, if you're on a statin drug, that depletes CoQ10, and that can cause a lot of the leg and the muscle problems. So a lot of people find when they add CoQ10 in, all of a sudden that starts going away. PQQ, you really can't get from the diet. And it, the other side with PQQ is, you if you take it for a month, you're not gonna go, wow, I'm cooking. It's because the mitochondria go up and it's more, five years or 10 years from now, your energy level will be higher than it would have been, but there's no way for you to then say, okay, I wanna go back and have a do-over and see where I was. So that's why PQQ is just starting to get some traction because it's more of a preventative than a treatment. Okay. So has anyone studied that? In other words, has, has there been enough They've gone, longevity of this knowledge yeah, to well, have seen yeah. somebody 10 years ago or 15 years PQQ, ago compared to today? PQQ was in the literature probably 15, 20 years ago. People started taking it, but they didn't see results in two weeks, so they stopped taking it. But some people have been, and now with the technology we have, they can go right into, take a biopsy of our cells and count the number of mitochondria. So they can have, have you go along for let's say six months or a year, and you'll see the numbers going down, and you start taking it, and you can see that in the same person it flattens out and then starts going up. And there's been a lot of studies on that. So I think mainstream is probably eventually going to come up with, hey, I don't want you to take PQ, but that'll be a while. Okay, some questions to ask or to think about. Um, how long have you had the inflammation? What's your activity level? Do you usually wake up feeling refreshed or do you wake up exhausted? Because if you're not getting a good night's sleep, that's when you recharge your battery. And if you're not getting a good night's sleep, you kind of feel good the next day. So sleep is very, very important. What foods are you choosing and drinking and eating? Any digestive issues? Are you routinely exposed to chemicals and pollutants? Because the toxicity can raise your inflammation level. So it isn't a simple, it isn't a hard thing, and it isn't rocket science, but it isn't, I have inflammation, what can I take for it? You always want to try to figure out, why do I have it? What could I be doing different to make it better? I might need something for the pain now, because I'm miserable, but that makes you feel better, which will allow you to do the work to get better. Okay, lifestyle changes. Those are the hardest things to get people to do. Change the diet, change their activity, change, try to change their stress level. You want to start exercising. Now, if someone has virtually no exercise because they hurt, I'm even talking about if the weather's nice, going out the front door, walking to the corner, and walking back. That's a good start if you're very, very inactive. 
and then you do that every day, and then maybe go one more house or one more driveway. It doesn't have to be, I feel good, I'm going out and walking five miles, and then you can't get out of bed the next day. <laughs> Same thing at the gym, or if you're going to a pool. If you haven't been active, even five minutes more than you normally do is a good jump. And you'll find as you do that, you're gonna start being able to do more and more. And even though the joints hurt, if you have bad knees, you don't wanna be out running. That's pounding, which isn't good for the knees. How about an exercise bike, or water aerobics, or swimming, or even um, a cross trainer. You know, the cross trainers, your feet never come off the pads. There's no impact. So there's always a way to do it. We need to be eating better, reduce stress, sipping plenty of water, and have a healthy lifestyle. I love this quote, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes. And give it to I, I know, sometimes that happens when you can't get it to work, you shut it off and then it works fine. This time it didn't. But the next thing is a cup of coffee on top of it. But that's very, very important. We all need every day to find minimum 20 minutes or a half hour to shut everything off and do something we enjoy and not feel guilty that we're not doing something else. That'll do more for your mental and physical health than just about anything else. And if we really think about it, how many of us, uh, probably, what, 80% of us have smartphones with email and text and Facebook and Twitter and God knows what else, and all, and all that. 99% of what comes through on that is garbage. What about meditation? I heard that reduces inflammation. Meditation? Meditation is excellent. It does hurt, does, I mean, hurt, yeah. it reduces that's inflammation. That's unplugging. Yeah. yeah. And the, one of the reasons that's very good is when we're stressed, we generate more free radicals, which then damage protein and cause inflammation and increase aging. When you meditate, you're, I don't want to say you're zoning out, because you're doing a lot of work when you're meditating, but it's very relaxing to the mind and the body. And that's very, very good. Now, some people find they can't meditate. When they go, go to a meditation class and they try to clear their mind, that's when all the thoughts come rushing in. So they really need help being able to just open your mind but it doesn't necessarily have to be meditation it could be I have one of my clients she loves cleaning you know, which she finds very relaxing but I told her you have to start relaxing she thanked me she got a toothbrush and cleaned the grout in three bathrooms she found that yeah <laughs> that takes some stress off you but it's whatever relaxes you and it helps you enjoy because enjoyment just like what do they say a minute of la or laughing yeah. I forget what the quote is but you know one laugh is so beneficial compared to a little bit of aggravation which really destroys us so yes um, not long ago I was going through a very stressful period of time on antidepressants and I went to see my uh, my therapist, and she suggested I have testing because I wasn't getting better. And so they discovered that I uh, needed l methylfolate And once I was put on that, the antidepressant worked. And well, I, that's something that was very critical for me. Yeah, now that's going to be, I already gave a lecture, and I'll hopefully be giving another one in the next couple of months. With the mapping of the genome and our genetics, is a relatively, they're inexpensive. It used to be 23andMe, but they've eliminated a lot of the genes they're testing. But some of us have genetic problems, which we all do, but it can affect the folic acid, the B12. Is, it's like gears in a Swiss watch. There's all these different metabolic circles. The downside of this new technology is you don't want to find out you have a gene SNP. Oh, if I have this SNP, I need to take that. Because in your instance, adding the methylfolate worked right off the bat. Sometimes there could be other problems, and if you get this gear spinning, but the one right next to it is still <clears throat> jammed up, you could feel worse. But methylfolate, and when I have the next lecture, and there's one on our website too, 
It's a big chart. Methylfolate is needed to help with the, it's called the BH4 cycle. And the BH4 cycle is what has to be working to make serotonin and dopamine and all of our neurotransmitters. So in your instance, you were missing that little bit of seasoning. So you didn't have the folic acid, that enzyme couldn't work to make your neurotransmitters. So you didn't have a deficiency of a pharmaceutical, you had a deficiency of a necessary nutrient the body needed to run on all eight cylinders. So, you know, it, it's rocket science, but it really isn't, it's basics. But the only reason I bring it up is because it's not uncommon. It's very common. They feel 60 to 70% of people have that SNP <clears throat> on the folic acid. Now the other side is, if you have the SNP, that means that pathway probably is only working at 30 to 60% efficiency. But the body's a wonderful machine, and in a lot of people, it figures out an alternate way to get it working. And so it's usually not mega doses you need, you need enough so it works properly. So that's very good, that's a nice easy solution once you found it. When you say SNP, what do you mean? SNP. It's, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. Okay, so it's a yeah. So it's in our genetics that you get part of the gene from mom and part from dad, and there can be some corruption. And the interesting thing is toxicity causes a lot of the corruption. So again, we're aggravating a bad situation, or a situation that could be bad. Okay. So what can you do on the physical side? You can adhere to a good sleep routine. Avoid exposure to toxins. Oil prices went way up. Every newer, not even newer, probably going back, when did Tyvex come out? 25 years ago? Houses are wrapped. We have new replacement windows. We plugged every single hole. I grew up in an old Victorian house, and if you sat by within a foot or two of one of the windows, we live near the ocean, you need to have a coat on, you want the heat on, because the air was blowing through. But in a way, that was good, the air was changing. Now they're finding, in the winter time, in most households, the air inside the house is so toxic, it's worse than being in Boston in the middle of the summer on a hot Monday day. And one of the reasons is, think about it, spray, your window cleaner, or the stuff you use to scrub the bathroom. And all these chemicals we use as cleaners and get new furniture. A lot of it's pressed wood. You have formaldehyde gas coming out. That's what they pickle us with when we die. <laughs> and we're inhaling all that. And the air isn't changing. And then you have, for a while, they had formaldehyde insulation blown into the walls. You know, that was a real brilliant thought. <laughs> doing that. So we have, start looking at what your cleaners are, your laundry detergent, all of the, the sheets that we put in the dryer that smell nice. Those are all chemicals. Uh, the regular ones are all chemicals. And you can even smell it when you're out for a walk. If somebody has their dryer on, you smell it. You're inhaling chemicals. And then you're using the chemicals and them putting the clothes on. So think about a lot of the things you're using. Mother Nature has some great products for cleaning, for cutting grease, getting stains out. Um, let's see, work with Mother Nature. You want to eat a healthy, non-inflammatory diet. Develop healthy relationships. So the stress can be from an unhealthy relationship. Can we go back, I'm sorry, can we go back to the diet? What do you consider like a Mediterranean diet, paleo diet? I'm gonna go oh, into okay. specifics, nice. good question. Just get, it. I think it's a couple of slides up. What's Financial, the EMF mean? EMF? Uh, um, electromagnetic um, radiation of frequencies. Your cell phones. A lot of the kids sleep on their cell phone. How many people use their cell phone as an alarm clock? You keep it right by your head. 8.95 on Amazon, you can get an alarm clock that plugs in. You don't need something transmitting to a tower every half a second. And that's going through your brain. And that's going through you. Don't, your cell phone should be left in the kitchen, not in the bedroom. You don't need it in the bedroom. Um, 
you know, we're, we like to think we're important, but we're not that uh -huh. important. If someone has an emergency, they should call their parents or 911 or something like that. So we get away from the cell phones. We're on our computers. We're using um, Wi-Fi all the time. The lights, now these are very low. We have them replaced. Uh -oh. oh. It's talking to you. Oh. Your gremlins are following you. Yeah. But so you want to limit the elect the extra electrical things. Keep them away from you. Um, so that's very very important. Liver support, digestive support. Take supplements when you need it. Get some sun. Sun is healthy and harmful. Too much sun causes skin cancer. Some sun helps prevent certain cancers. It gives us vitamin D, which we need. So you don't want to go out like we did when I was a kid. Everyone, you know, go out and get, you know, you're pale, go outside and get some color. Or, you know, I remember my um, my cousins, my older cousins, used to put baby oil on and then <laughs> reflectors and all that. No, and when you go to the beach during the high time of the sun, be like grandma used to be, get under an umbrella. Wear a wide brim hat. You get some of the sun reflecting up. So the sun's important. We want to do um, get the supplements that we need. Eat well. Reduce mental and physical stress wherever possible. Now, where are we? Free radicals. I'm just going to talk for a second. Free radicals are uh, um, in the outer mm -hmm. orbit of the molecule. There should be two uh, pairs of two electrons. When there's only one, nature doesn't like that. So that molecule will go grab an electron, usually from a protein in our body, which damages it. And then that protein becomes a free radical. So it's almost like a game of pool where you're breaking that. One free radical hits all the balls and they all turn into free radicals. So you wanna make sure you're eating well and you're getting all the vitamins you need, the B vitamins. You wanna be getting fresh fruits and vegetables. They're loaded with antioxidants. Where we need free radicals, that's how we fight infection. Too many free radicals kills us and causes inflammation. So there's a balancing act, but if you eat healthy, that's the best thing to do. You want to support digestion. You want to help your nutrients get absorbed. You want to help calm down inflammation in the gut. There's all sorts of things. If someone, and I just, I'm not going to go over all these. But if someone has a very inflamed bowel, if when you go to the bathroom, your stool comes out paper thin, um, pencil thin, that's the bowel being inflamed. Something like the glutus shield or endofin has nutrients in there that helps heal the gut and helps calm the inflammation, not suppress it. So then you can start absorbing the nutrients you need to heal the gut. Because if the gut's a mess and you can't get the nutrients in, you're never gonna get it better. So there's all sorts of things you can do, a multi-strain probiotic, digestive enzyme, and I have two different charts here. This is the intestinal tract in a healthy person and in a non-healthy person. The blue are the cells. We're supposed to have one layer of cells and they're supposed to be real tight together. So only what should get in gets in. Every once in a while, something, an antigen, something we're not supposed to get in, gets in, the body produces an antibody and takes care of it. That's our safety system. When the gut's inflamed and those cells are inflamed, the openings get bigger and everything flows in. And that's why a lot of people, as we get older, there's more and more foods that cause problems because the gut, for a leaky gut, your gut is leaking. When all these antigens get in there and the antibodies start attacking them, that causes inflammation. Here's another picture of the cells with a tight junction and down there is unhealthy and you can see bigger things get in. Um, not real numbers, let's say you always eat chicken or eggs and now you react to eggs. When the junctions were tight, the eggs were supposed to get broken down to a two molecule group and come in and the immune system says, yep, you are safe. When the openings are bigger, a six molecule group gets in and your immune system's doing its job. It's attacking it. That's foreign and it's not supposed to be there and that causes inflammation and that can cause allergic reactions and that can cause inflammation through the body, depression, sinus problems, all sorts of issues. 
So you want to, the pathway will do it backwards. If you want to get chronic joint pain, the simple things to do is eat an inflammatory diet, white flour, white sugar, high gluten, processed foods, chemical laden foods, lunch meats, things like that. You know, once in a while as a treat, it's fine. As a treat, the body can deal with it. But if that's your staple, that's what you're eating all the time, it gets overwhelmed. You want to, you have like a digestive problem, you start getting more toxins into the bloodstream, which causes more inflammation. The whole body starts getting inflamed, you have pain, you start taking pharmaceuticals for the pain, which goofs up the system more, and then you have tissue destruction. But you can go the other way. If you are down here, if you start cleaning up above, you can heal and get away from that. Yeah. Yes? How can you tell if you have leaky gut syndrome? What are the symptoms? Usually there's digestive problems, bowel problems that you just can't take care of. There are lab tests that can be done. But usually if you have anyone that has a digestive problem, there's some inflammation in there and the gut's leaking. But very rarely is it so severe that with some help, it can't be corrected. Okay. okay. Um, the healing the gut, you want to remove if there's any pathogens, if you have candida or if you um, have any worms or things like that, which are becoming more and more popular here in the U.S. You want to remove the inflammatory foods. To answer the question from the back, you want to eat good night as much as you can, organic fruits, vegetables, free-range meat, the real fish that are out there swimming for survival, not eating cornmeal in a pen. What salmon eats cornmeal in the wild? You know, they don't know from corn, but that's what we were feeding the farm-raised salmon before. And that's why they had to add all the dyes to make the salmon flesh orange, because it was coming out white. Nobody wanted white salmon. That should have confused why is it white? Probably because it's not nutritional. You want to avoid anything you're allergic to. Gluten, does everyone have to be on a 100% gluten-free diet? No. But the problem is, with the way our food supply is, there's gluten in just about everything we put in our mouth, which it isn't supposed to be. So if you're not celiac and you don't have a gluten sensitivity, having some gluten is okay. But you don't want to have crackers and bread and white flour every single meal. We weren't meant to eat that. We were meant to be out picking things, not changing what Mother Nature gave us. So eat the real foods. On, it's not always possible to get all organic. Go online and look up the Dirty Dozen, and it changed this year. Some of the ones that weren't on the list are, and some of them that were at the end of the list are number two and three, but there's a bunch of foods that, except for once in a while, you should not even eat them because they're so chemically laden because of the way they're grown that you can't wash it off won't come off, it's in the food itself. So you want to avoid those. White flour, white sugar are terrible. You want to replace the bacteria. Good probiotic, you want them for the most part to be live. You want, you, most people don't need mega doses, you know, 200, 400 billion. You want 12 or 14 different bacteria to cover the whole track. You want some I brought this down because the spelling is terrible. Saccharomyces boulardii. That's a beneficial yeast. That helps get rid of candida. That also helps people in the hospital that get C. diff, which gives you explosive diarrhea. They usually sterilize the gut to get rid of everything. And they're now using Saccharomyces along with a probiotic, and it's very effective. And that also protects the caretakers from getting it for the most part. If you think of the probiotic and the Saccharomyces, it really, it's like a lawn. If you take care of your soil, you water it, you put good bacteria in there, you have good nutrients in there, and you overseed the bare spots with some grass seed. You don't have to put it down three inches thick, and you water it and it gets sunlight, you're gonna still have dandelions and crabgrass, but it'll just be a few odd pieces and nature takes care of itself. If you don't take care of it, you have to use poisons and high sulfur fertilizers to force the grass to grow. 
In our gut, it's the same thing. The lining of the gut is very, very healthy soil. And the good bacteria and the Saccharomyces boulardii work at keeping the environment the way it should be. So the candida might be there, but in background amounts. If you were exposed to a tapeworm, it won't be able to thrive and latch on and grow. So it keeps the bad guys in check. It also, the good bacteria have to do with our hormone balancing, digestion, elimination, and 60 to 70 percent of our immune system function comes from the good bacteria. So very important. We're drinking, if you're drinking tap water, it has chlorine in it. Why do we have chlorine in it? Because there's a lot of bad bacteria in the water. But it's not a smart bomb. We drink it, and the fluoride also, it kills a lot of the good bacteria. If you're not eating free-range products, you're getting antibiotics in your system, which are gonna kill the good bacteria. If you're eating the wrong foods, all the bad foods, you're changing the environment, so the grass starts dying. So very simple, you don't need mega doses, but just overseed a little bit every day. The, the first thing up there about removed pathogens, so <coughs> do those remove the pathogens? Depending upon, these are just a couple of herbs that can be very helpful depending upon what it is. Oh, okay. And even though these are all natural, they're harsh. So you should only take, really, you should only take anything if you've got some guidance that that's what's right for exactly what's wrong with you. Someone has diarrhea, they shouldn't start taking this because odds are it isn't due to a pathogen. But it's a very simple stool test, and when they do the stool test, they also test drugs and some of the labs and test some of the natural herbs to see the susceptibility. So you want, if you're taking something hard, you want to make sure it's the right thing that's going to work real well for a short period of time. Good question. Okay, research on probiotics. People who received, they did a placebo, and they did a couple of strains of certain probiotics, and they measured inflammatory markers in the body. And with healthy bacteria in the gut, the amount of inflammation in the body went down. But the flip side of that, I like it the other way. With a lack of good bacteria, inflammation goes up. So it's not so much you're treating inflammation with bacteria. By having the gut healthy, you're minimizing your inflammation. Um, they, the good bacteria, female and male hormones, digestion, absorption, it helps, the good bacteria help chew up the cholesterol when the liver dumps it into the bowel so it doesn't get reabsorbed. It inhibits growth of the bad bacteria, the, um, it inhibits the growth of candida. And due to our lifestyle and our diet, we're feeding the bad guys and starving the good guys. And it's not that hard. You know, if you go to the supermarket, your eye goes to the bright colored fruits and vegetables. I think there's very few people who see a head of iceberg lettuce and salivate and say, I hardly wait to sink my teeth into this when I get home. Because your brain knows there's nothing there but water and a little fiber. There's no nutrients there. But the red pepper are apples in season, or the grapes when they're growing, or strawberries. Don't you smile when you get a fresh picked strawberry and you bite into it and it's red on the inside instead of just on the outer layer <laughs> because nature made us that way so that's what we would our eyes would go to because that's where all the antioxidants and the healthy stuff is we talk about this um, so probiotics you want live strains you want multiple strains is some people say but I'm traveling the something like this is a refrigerated one it's stable out of the refrigerator. It's the high heat, a long term that does it. You don't want to put it in Florida in your trunk if you're traveling around. But if you're flying to California and it's in your carry-on on the plane, no problem. But if you're going, we have people who are going over to the Middle East or the Far East and it's going to be 110 degrees and there's no refrigeration a lot. There are some good, stable, non-refrigerated ones. They put them in suspended animation, then when they get into the gut, they wake up. So they're still alive. They're still alive, but they're not, li they're not going forth and multiplying right now, whereas <laughs> these guys are. So I guess 
there's a lot of information and there isn't one answer. Each of us are getting to our inflammation and our health problems a different way. So whether it's with us here or somewhere else, you want to work with somebody and you want that somebody to be somebody who really practices what they preach but also takes the time to figure out what's going on with you and you and you and suggest and can explain why this might be much better for you than that. An example, digestive enzymes. This is a vegetarian one. It's the number one selling in the country. It's excellent. It covers all the food groups. This one's phenomenal, but everyone doesn't have to take it. But we have, I think, about 40% of the population have their gallbladder out. And they're not making concentrating bile. They can't digest fats. We need fats for energy. We need fats for in to help with inflammation. This one has ox bile in it. And people who you have their gallbladder out, usually within a couple of months, the digestive systems are wreck again. And you add in a good digestive enzyme with bile, all of a sudden it gets better. Not rocket science, but the body needs bile. The gallbladder wasn't an extra piece in a kit from Ikea. You know, you can live without it. So, but does everyone need to take this one with the extra bile? No, and that's where talking to someone who has an idea of what they're doing can be helpful. Yes? I have a question. How long are you supposed to take probiotics? Is it for rest months? Rest of your life. Rest of your life, every day. Okay. Right from best thing a pregnant woman or a woman who's thinking of getting pregnant can give her future offspring is taking omega-3 and a probiotic. And we can all use that. If you have explosive diarrhea, you have a stomach bug, or you're on high doses of antibiotics, you need mega doses of probiotics. But I'm talking four to 20 billion. Um, I take it every day. If everything is going well, you can go three, every other day, three times a week. Everyone should be on it, not when you have a problem, because it's so helpful for us. Thank you. Would you, would you, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, would, would you say the same about digestive enzyme? Di well, okay, very good. Another good question. Um, you guys are great. Digestive enzymes. Way, way back, Mother Nature put enough enzymes, or more than enough enzymes in all our food for mammals to digest the food and give us some extra enzymes. And the proteolytic enzymes, the, um, the ones that help with protein digestion also help when we have inflammation to help break down damaged protein and get all that metabolic waste out. Problem is, we don't have good food anymore. So there isn't enough enzymes in the food to digest. And in our lifetime, we can make this much of enzyme. So what's happening is since I grew up in the Crisco and the fast food generation, we wound up using our enzymes up a lot faster because we had to use them not for protection for inflammation, but to break the food down. So as we get older, we've already used up what was in the bucket, or there isn't enough. So that's where taking enzymes. Then people were saying, but if I take enzymes, my body will stop making them. They've done study after study that isn't true. And so, what I do, my digestion is knock on wood good. But if I go out, if we go out to eat, I take a digest goal. Or if we go over to someone's house for a party, I'm going to be eating things I don't eat at home. I take it. But I don't take it every day. People who have stomach issues or irritable bowel syndrome or gassy, that's the food fermenting, not digesting, taking an enzyme every day with each meal would be good. Yes? You got a particular eye? Diverticulitis too, the bowel's inflamed, it's not working right. Now, if you have a bleeding ulcer in the stomach, you don't want to take an enzyme because the protease could irritate that. So again, talking to somebody can let you know when it's time to take it, if you do have a bleeding ulcer. What's the thinking today on taking a baby aspirin every day? <laughs> um, if my doctor, who's very open-minded and progressive, feels if there's a history in the family and you're at higher risk, then it might be a good idea. But just to say everyone over 52 should be taking baby aspirin. A higher risk for what? 
for cardiovascular problems. So, you know, you have to look at the family. Now also, if your mom, or God forbid, your mom or your dad had a heart attack, but their lifestyle was awful, it probably had nothing to do with the genetics, it had to do with their life. Okay. So good foods, enzymes. These are the foods that are loaded with enzymes. And organic foods. Um, if you're even these fermented foods, have good bacteria and a lot of enzymes, but the things like sauerkraut and kefir and all that, that are made by nature, not by man. It can't go in a factory and zip through and come out done. It takes time to sit there, to grow and to break down properly. That'll help with the enzymes. Kiwi, excellent. And kiwis, I remember nobody would eat kiwis before. Now kiwi is one of the most popular foods and it's delicious and it's good for us. So again, if you look at this, all the bright and vibrant colors, your eye goes to that and it looks delicious. What are your thoughts on nightshade vegetables? Nightshades are very healthy and very harmful. If you are susceptible to nightshades or sensitive to nightshades, you should avoid them. So again, just about everything is good and bad. Kale, excellent, excellent. One of our friends went nuts with kale. She got a, it wasn't a neutral bullet, it was one of the other machines. Vitamix. And it might have been a Vitamix, but she started, you know, because you can take a pound or two of kale and make a six ounces of mm -hmm. liquid. So she was eating close to two pounds of kale a day. She wasn't eating it, she was drinking it. And it's delicious, and she was throwing other things in, and I'm gonna be so healthy. She was in the hospital for three and a half weeks. She was so impacted that they couldn't get her regular, they couldn't get her bowels to work for a while. She was a real sick lady. So too much of something good. Same thing, tomatoes. You might be a little sensitive to nightshades, and having a little tomato on your salad is good, the problem is in the summertime, when you're growing tomatoes, you, know, you have 30 of them on your counter, and they're delicious because they just came off the vine. Most people will have a problem with nightshades if they eat too much of them. So it's we're all individuals, and we have to look at what's right for us. So the proteolytic enzymes um, help digest protein and break it down. When you have inflammation, you're bringing all that metabolic waste in, and you have damaged proteins. That damaged protein has to be digested and spit out by the body. And that's what the proteolytic enzymes do. And you're getting them in your food. You can also buy them separately. But if you're not eating good quality food, all your enzymes are going to try to digest the junk you're eating. Or the food that doesn't have enough, um, it's not real fresh, doesn't have enough enzymes. So that means you bang yourself or you shovel the snow and you're a little bit inflamed, you don't have the pro enough proteolytic enzymes to clean up the mess and you find the next day. So then it starts turning from acute into chronic. Some of them, pepsin, bromelain, papain, or papain, depending upon how you say it. Um, pineapple, very, very good for inflammation. Unless you're sensitive to pineapple, then you shouldn't use it. But this is all sorts of things. These are some of the foods that are a good source of enzymes. Papaya, kiwi, <laughs> sauerkraut, yogurt. Now the yogurt kefir, those type of things, not the ones where they make it in the factory and then they add the bacteria in at the end. The bacteria make the yogurt. And yogurt's supposed to have good bacteria. So if it goes through a process and then they have to add the bacteria because it isn't there, really isn't yogurt. So you want the Greek yogurt mostly. I'm sorry? Do you know the difference? Well, some of them were even saying X number of billion organisms added. Mm -hmm. You know, but most of the good, the real Greek yogurts are real yogurt. Um, sauerkraut, you can now, they're even labeling it naturally made sauerkraut as opposed to you slice up cabbage, add in the vinegar and all that, and it tastes like, you know, sauerkraut. Okay, this slide, enzymes like papaya, you wanna be careful, it's not be taken during pregnancy because it could um, trigger a miscarriage. And so again, 
I put this in just because it's natural doesn't mean it's healthy for everyone and in any quantity. You can drown in water and wear 70, 80% water, but too much water can kill us. So everything in moderation, anything you're putting in your mouth, know what it's for, how much you're supposed to take, what it should be doing, and what you should notice. Well, that was me, because I can talk till the cows come home, so I set an alarm to remind me. <laughs> so three o'clock, you're all not sound asleep. Okay, you want to reduce inflammation. Remember years ago, people used to take Epsom salt baths? Yeah. <coughs> Epsom salt is magnesium and sulfur. Magnesium gets absorbed through the skin, and magnesium is very calming to the brain and the muscles, the sore muscles, and I hope $4.95 for four pounds of it. Real budget buster. Very, very helpful. But there's also magnesium from the ocean. You know, the brine flakes, which is excellent also. And this is real pure and it's extremely clean. It's from the ancient seabed, um, you know, where they dug way, way down. Back then there weren't many pollutants, so it was cleaner. But you'll find, if you take a bath, one, you have to sit still for 20 minutes or a half hour. If you're smart, you're not going to bring a TV in there or your cell phone because it's a $900 cell phone. You don't want to drop it in the water. You have to zone out. You have to meditate. Or just sit there. Light a few candles if you want. And soak. Get magnesium in. We are low on magnesium. Everyone's low on magnesium. Um, I try to practice what I preach. And I was really surprised for one of the classes I'm taking on the genetics, there's a lot of blood testing to be done to see where you are. And I was shocked doing everything that I think I should be doing. My vitamin D wasn't where I thought it was. With my genetic SNPs, my vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid was much lower. I wasn't taking enough of it. And my magnesium was low. And I'm, my wife is great. I'm eating well, I'm taking my supplements, but because of the genetics, I needed a little more magnesium. When I increased my magnesium in the right form a little bit, all of a sudden I found the next day after the gym, it wasn't as tight, and it also relaxes the brain and helps you calm <coughs> down. So even if we're doing everything right, sometimes we have to check things because we might need to do more of everything right or less of everything right. Um, Anti-inflammatory diet, very, very important. Again, the big things on the anti-inflammatory diet. Eat organic, eat real foods, eat raw foods. But don't, if you don't eat much raw foods, don't eat much fiber, ease into it slowly. If you add too much raw and too much fiber, you are gonna get so gassy and either diarrhea or so constipated, you're gonna say, I'm going back to McDonald's. I feel much better. It's like a baby, when you start adding new foods, a baby you give them one spoonful. You don't give them a whole meal of something. We have to let the body figure out how to digest it. And a lot of us haven't been eating real food for a long time, so our body doesn't know how to digest it. You have to give it time and help it. Foods to eliminate, gluten, dairy, soy, corn, peanuts, citrus fruits are there, but Citrus fruits are very good, but most of the citrus fruits, if they're not organic, are so chemically laden, you're better off not eating them. So there's a little asterisk that should be there on the citrus fruits. Hydrogenated oils, fats, got a bad rap from cholesterol. All fats are bad. We need fat. We make more energy in the mitochondria from a gram of fat than a gram of protein or carbs. And we stop eating all fats. And if you eat a higher amount of fats, you start making some ketones, not ketoacidosis, which is a diabetic problem, but ketones are used in the mitochondria and they produce the most energy in the mitochondria. So you wanna have healthy fats, you wanna have protein, you wanna have complex carbs, every meal and every snack. Coconut oil made a big comeback, both to put on your skin and cook with. Coconut oil is very good. Too much coconut oil has too much saturated fat. So everything in moderation. Added sugar. People are saying, you're not supposed to have white sugar. I can't have fruit because fruit has sugar. It has fiber in it also. 
and it has other things in it. You don't want to be eating 12 oranges a day. But natural sugar, we need natural sugar. But we lump all sugars together. So just eat real food. Increase bone broth, very, very good. And that's making a comeback. I remember my grandmother used to always be making bone broth. Now you can buy the powder and make your own broth nice and easy. Um, raw milk are the f from free range cattle, probiotics, coconut products, leafy greens, the cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli, the cauliflower, all those help with phase two detoxing. So they're very helpful. But you want to eat a whole head of broccoli every day. No, that's unhealthy. But having some, very, very good. Um, high quality proteins, healthy fats, not man-made fats. Can I go out and have dessert in a restaurant or if I go to a real good restaurant and they make the best pesto and it's real hard crusted bread but it's white for you know it's white might be multi-grain but it has white flour enjoy yourself if you're behaving all the time you deserve a treat it's when you misbehave all the time that it builds up and kills us so you don't have to be totally anal about it you just want to make sure when you go off track it's worth it. It's not just a reheated roll in a restaurant. It's a delicious piece of bread. Um, what about uh, alcohol and coffee? Okay. Wine. Um, in moderation, for most people, it's fine. And alcohol helps stimulate phase one, phase two. And coffee, like in the morning, can help wake up the liver. Not a 96 ounce <laughs> double espresso about a cup of coffee. Um, dietary changes, again, organic to avoid the pesticides and herbicides, real food, stuff nature gave us, healthy fats, um, the omega-3s are excellent from fish. If you don't like fish, you can supplement that. Grass-fed beef, the wild fish, not farm-raised. Um, you want to um, cut down on gluten, and cut down on dairy. People who don't have a dairy problem don't have to eliminate it. But you don't want to have too much because it's very mucus producing and that isn't good for the gut or the sinuses. So avoid processed meat, um, too much beer. I'm not gonna say eliminate beer, I love beer. White sugar, the processed flours. Now we've said eggs aren't dangerous. For a while, nobody should eat any eggs. So people are eating 18 and 24 eggs a week. I'm very unhealthy, but half a dozen a week, no problem. Everything in moderation. Anyone use apple cider vinegar? Anyone remember great-grandparents and grandparents using apple cider vinegar? Okay, very good for digestion. You take two teaspoons and some water at the beginning of a meal, it gets the digestive juices flowing. It also helps alkalinize the body, and most of us are too acidic. And so very, very good. It's getting a bad rap a little bit, because what people are doing is they're taking their water bottle and putting apple cider vinegar in and sipping all day long. So you're bathing your teeth in acids, like bathing it in Coke, Coca-Cola. That's not healthy. But if you mix it up, drink it down, you eat your meal, and then you should be brushing your teeth, no problem at all. But you don't want to be sipping it all through the day. You want to mix it up and knock it back. That is so phenomenal for inflammation because if you alkalinize the body, inflammation goes down. If you get the digestion working better, you're getting more nutrients in so the body can do its work to deal with inflammation and injury better. Boswellia is an Ayurvedic herb, a phenomenal, it can be taken every single day, both to treat inflammation and to help the body get ready for inflammation. Curcumin is, and turmeric are getting a lot of play now. The problem is, again, you need to know where you're buying it, because turmeric and curcumin is poorly absorbed. And we have a little chart upstairs. If you just take Roundup curcumin, you need probably about 150 capsules a day to get somewhat of a blood level. So then some of the companies started adding black pepper to it, and that makes it much better, but you need usually six to 12 of those. There's a process, and on the back it should say BCM 95, 
one 500 milligram capsule gives you a full day's blood level. So you can take one a day. Bad inflammation, you can go up to two. This is such a good anti-inflammatory. The NIH did a study on it, and they came from the National Institute of Health. Their conclusion was it is a better anti-inflammatory than any pharmaceutical and virtually no side effects. What yes. was the last ingredient? I'm just, I want to check mine when I get home and make sure it's... ECM95. Okay. It'll say it in the little facts on yeah. the back. Okay, thank you. Okay. There's some homeopathics that are very, very good. So, really, if you talk to the right person, if you want an herbal product, if you want a nutritional product, if you want a homeopathic product, if you can't swallow a capsule and you want a liquid, if you want something topical, something like the toprosin, very, very good as a homeopathic plant for any soft tissue inflammation or injury. And the trick with homeopathy is a little bit very often works much better than a big lob once or twice a day. So when people get toprosin and they say it isn't working, I ask them how are you using it and they say morning and night. So we guarantee it. I say I'm not giving you money back. You're not using it right. I will give you your money back, but start going home now. Stop putting it on every hour until you go to bed and usually get a call the next day, geez, that stuff works. Because it can't work if you don't use it right. So homeopathy. Is that the same thing it has arnica and about eight other remedies in there for the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles, the blood flow. Lack of any of these can cause inflammation to go up. So do I have milligrams of each one you should take? Absolutely not. It's like seasoning in a soup. We need to be eating a healthy diet and we're getting some of all of these. Then if you happen to have, like I did, low magnesium, you add a little in. That, um, somebody had low folic acid and so they added that in but if your folic acid isn't low and you're using it right you don't double the amount you're taking to help with inflammation or to help with depression it's not going to work so you need to figure out where your problem is and what to do um, hyaluronic acid in the joints and in the eye we were born and we have hyaluronic acid hyaluronic acid helps thicken and lubricate joints, and it thickens the liquid in the eye. And that's why when we get older, we start having more floaters, because all the little fibers in there start floating around. Best way to take it is in liquid. You get much better absorption. It's in an oil, and you need a fatty substance to help it get absorbed. So this can be very helpful for the joint pain and the eyes. Um, vitamin D we talked about in the omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 from vegetable oils is pro-inflammatory. And most of us are getting too much 6 in the diet and we're not getting enough 3. So our inflammation level is much higher than it should be because the body can't balance it. Again, consults here, wherever you're going. If you have more than just a little acute problem, you can talk to someone. But if it's beginning to be a chronic problem, you need to figure out what's going on in you. And somebody needs to work with you to have a team effort to guide you through. Because what you're doing today is probably going to change in a month because hopefully you're in a much better place. You don't need all the support you started today. So work with someone. Don't just keep buying things that you read on the internet. You know, if you think about it and the stuff that comes in the mail or in your email, it, it could have sawdust in it, but if you get a good marketer to write it properly, it's the best thing. And then Dr. Gary said, this helps 90% of his patients, and there's no such Dr. Gary, but hey, if Dr. Gary said it, then, so you really have to talk to someone who's what they're doing. And that's the end of that. Thank you. Um, thank you. You go upstairs again, I'll be glad. As long as you want, I'll let the answer the question. Just one, one last question. Yeah.